we're grateful to have you all here with us for another Lunchbox Talk. And we're nearing our finale for our Saving Our Savannas six month program. So great to have another person from our North Carolina Botanical Garden here with us today. I'm Joanna Massey Lalikas. I'm the Director of Learning and Community Engagement with the Garden. And my colleague in the back, David Michaud, is here to support all the technology as well as our Zoom audience. So if you have any needs, uh, David can help you with those in the chat. So without further ado, I will introduce our special guest today. Michael Kuntz is the Director of Conservation Programs here at the North Carolina Botanical Garden at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he received his bachelor's and master's degrees in biology from the University of Colorado at Boulder and is currently pursuing a PhD in plant ecology right here at UNC Chapel Hill. Since joining the Botanical Garden in 2005, he has worked on management of natural areas and the ex situ conservation and restoration of imperiled plants. Michael's interest is in the ecology, reintroduction, and phylogeography of rare plant species. And Mike's going to share with us all that we are doing here at the North Carolina Botanical Garden related to longleaf pine restoration. So Mike, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Joanna, for the great uh, introduction. And um, really great to see you all here today and all the folks on Zoom today. Um, appreciate uh, a lot. Uh, people who kind of reorganized schedules. I think the first time this was originally scheduled, Joanna and I realized we had a conflict with another program um, that a bunch of people wanted to be in both places at once. So uh, we decided to move it to this one. So thank you all um, who were originally signed up uh, about a month ago and for coming back today. Uh, so um, as we, we talked a little bit about this talk, uh, we wanted to, to kind of bring to you all a little bit more about what the garden is doing and through some of our conservation work um, in the longleaf pine ecosystem. Um, and so I'll kind of go through some of that today, uh, some of the research we're doing and some of the applied conservation work uh, that we're doing. Um, and through this, I think hopefully you'll see and, and help to understand uh, that it really requires the work of a lot of people. Like we are one, one place, uh, just a few people, and really a lot of the work um, that I'll touch on has involved a lot of other people, but there are so many people that are doing really great work in the longleaf pine ecosystem. Um, and there's just more, more that can be covered probably even in a six month program, uh, let alone an hour talk. So um, some of what we'll cover today, we'll, we'll, we will go through uh, the longleaf pine ecosystem very broadly because it helps frame the ideas of what we'll talk about and the work that we're doing here at the garden and talk about our conservation program, specifically about the work we're doing with rare plants um, and, and restoring diversity uh, back into some of these areas. Mm -hmm. All right, so longleaf pine, if you've been to programs before, uh, over the last few months, you've probably seen this map or something very similar to it. The green outline there is the extent of the longleaf pine. Um, it covers most of the uh, Atlantic coastal plain physiographic province, but extends into Piedmont and a few others as well. Um, and here in North Carolina, uh, it covers about the eastern third of the state, more or less. Um, and it kind of encompasses a couple of different distinct areas that we can recognize uh, that do have differences between them. Uh, the sand hills, um, this kind of lightish pink tan uh, furthest in, this rolling topography, uh, but land of longleaf pine as well as the intercoastal plain and the outer coastal plain. And these are both areas that also have longleaf. Uh, but what a lot of people don't realize is that it's also in the Piedmont of North Carolina. There's just this very, very tiny bit. If you've ever been up to the Uwari National Forest, you're in that area where the longleaf still is present in the landscape um, through this Piedmont ecoregion. All right. So... Uh, the other thing that you've probably heard, especially if you talk, were at Alan's talk last night uh, or yesterday afternoon, is this idea that the southeast coastal plain is a biodiversity hotspot. Uh, this is a, a fairly new designation, uh, but if you look at the map, the green on this map very much kind of overlaps with this range of longleaf pines. So a lot of this uh, is, is very similar. So Noss et al. Uh, put this paper together 
2015, and it described both the diversity that occurs within this system and the, the threats that are present to it. We've had this massive loss of longleaf pine and a lot of the, the habitats, communities, and species that live within that. Um, and so it becomes this, this very important place for us because it's, it's incredibly important. It has uh, deep time. It's often overlooked. People think, oh, it was coastal plain. It's pretty young geologically, so it can't be that important. But when we look at the species that are present, we kind of find that there's both these refugia from both glaciation events as things get pushed down from the last ice age into the southeast and they found refugia. And then they also have refugia, despite its fairly flat topography, during level times of sea level rise. And so we've got this really great diversity of things that live within this ecosystem. And so here's kind of a, just a quick snapshot. This is of the coastal plain, not just of longleaf, but again, they're pretty overlapping, right? This very high level of endemism. Um, so these are plants that are, are distinct within that ecosystem. Almost a third of plants, third of freshwater fish, almost half of amphibians, right, that are, that are found, that live within that, are found only in this longleaf pine and this uh, coastal plain ecosystem. So it becomes really, really important. And then some of those also then start to become rare. Um, and, and we'll talk more about some of these rare plants as we go through today. Uh, oh, so quick example, just a few, a few of my favorites, a few of the things I like, some that are in North Carolina, some aren't. Uh, Carex lutea, an undescribed species of onion and the pink there on the top, Venus flytraps, Cooley's meadow rue, um, uh, pondberry. But then you also get things like gopher tortoises, red cockaded woodpeckers. So there's really unique things that are, that are really threatened, um, that really need help and attention. And, um, and the cause of these threats largely comes from this loss of land, right? Land conversion due to agriculture, subdivisions, uh, people living, right? There's some rapidly growing urban areas in throughout the longleaf pine ecosystem, right? So we've got these massive threats that are really pushing this um, destruction of this landscape, of this ecosystem. And then in addition to that, um, thanks, Debbie's here. I stole this picture from, from the TNC website because it's really just kind of a great shot of fire. It's better than anything on the ground where everything you're always shooting through is, seems to be smoky. Uh, but fire, and fire is a huge component of longleaf, right? It, it's a, a system, an entire ecosystem that is dependent on that ecological process. Um, and the fires that occur historically uh, were both caused by lightning, naturally occurring fires that probably burned really large scale, and also from culturally, uh, culturally set fires. So Native Americans that were using fire um, as tools to manage their landscape um, for themselves, for food. Uh, and, and so it becomes this very important process. So the map that you can see there, right, these are the flash densities, the amount of lightning that's occurring. And you can see, again, right, imagine that same green blob along the southeastern coastal plain. And these are some of the areas that are lighting up with the most lightning, reds and oranges and yellows. So there's a lot of lightning in this system that becomes super, super important. And as the climate changes, we have to start to worry about what that's doing to this fire regime because this ecosystem is completely designed by this fire and depends on this fire. And are we causing changes in the amount of lightning or when that lightning's occurring, the amount of drying of the vegetation? And for the managers, because we do have to use fire as a management tool, can we even still use that fire as much as or when we need to be able to do that? So um, kind of bringing it back down now from this big ecosystem, uh, level overview into what we're doing here at the garden. So um, our conservation programs here at the garden kind of have these four core areas that we work in. Uh, we do land conservation and management, um, and then rare plant research, reintroduction recovery. Uh, we have a plant materials center that we run, um, and then we do seed collections, distributions, and seed banking. Um, and so all of these kind of core areas in the conservation department will go through and we will touch on what the garden is doing in these. So, and the very first one, 
we don't do a lot of land conservation in the sand hills. Um, we really rely on our partners um, and our friends to be able to do that. I keep looking at Debbie as she's sitting there smiling, right? The Nature Conservancy has done so much work with land preservation and land stewardship in the sand hills um, in the coastal plain. Uh, and there are other organizations that are doing that as well, private landowners, um, as well as some of our, our state and federal partners and agencies. Uh, but we do have one small preserve in the sand hills. It's in Hope Mills, which is not far from Fayetteville. It's the Gordon but Butler Nature Preserve. Um, it's about 12 and a half acres, and it's uh, adjoined to some other undeveloped land, so it's effectively a little bit larger. Um, but it does have these longleaf pine forests on it, these longleaf pine flatwoods, uh, as well as home to one of our rare species, uh, the white wiki, uh, Calmia cuneata. Um, and so this is a property that we do try to get fire on as much as we can. Uh, it becomes increasingly challenging if you know the town of Hope Mills. It is booming and there's a lot going on and putting up smoke right in the middle of town um, isn't always the easiest thing to do from a management perspective. Um, so kind of moving on now to talk about some of these other conservation uh, measures that we do and, and talking about our seed bank. And really when we're talking about our seed bank for our rare species, we're talking about ways that we can help prevent and safeguard against extinctions in the wild. Um, and we do this through, through a very, um, what seems to me like a very simple way now. Uh, it's not always very simple, but we're collecting these seeds from these wild populations. We're bringing them back to the garden. We're drying them down under controlled conditions and putting them into freezers. And that way we have these uh, genotypes, these seeds that we have safeguarded. So if that population that's collected from, if something happens to it, right, we have that genetic material stored and we can do restoration work. We can continue to do research to better understand that. And I say it's a fairly simple process. Um, if you pull up the CPC best practices, uh, and the Center for Plant Conservation is a partner organization. Um, it's a group of, of gardens and arboreta across the country that really work on, on these rare plant issues. It's kind of started out very much as an ex situ organization, but over the years it has grown and now is this group of leading experts, not only in ex situ conservation, but in in situ conservation and restoration work. Um, but we put together, right, some of the best scientific minds in this come together and we put together these best practices. So we understand when we do our seed collections, we're not just going and grabbing a few seeds, right? They're done very scientifically. We collect by maternal line, right? We wanna make sure that we're capturing as much diversity as we can. So each individual plant has seeds collected from it and stored that way. So that if we do have to do some sort of restoration work, when we're doing that, we can make sure that we're not just putting out 50 individuals from the same parent, from the same individual mother. We're putting out 50 individuals that each have distinct and different genetics to try to keep that population as genetically diverse and healthy as possible. Um, and so how, how are we doing this and how successful have we been? So this is not just our seeds from the longleaf pine. This is all of our seeds uh, in our seed bank. Um, and so a few years ago, some partners, we got together and we kind of want to know how successful are we in capturing these rare species? Uh, and if you look at the, the red bar, um, that red bar really shows mm -hmm all of our federally listed species. So things that are protected by the Endangered Species Act, and we have just a little over 80% of the ones that occur within North Carolina in the seed bank. And some of those, about a third, are from coastal plain, longleaf pine areas. Uh, but then what we realized is that's not really capturing all of the rare species. Um, the Endangered Species Act is a political tool, right, that, that has a lot of implications and things may or may not be listed that need to be. And so what we really want to look at are these G ranks. So uh, G1s, right, is a way to, to look at these global distributions. These are really our most rare and imperiled plants. They either have a lot of threats that are facing them or they have very few populations. Um, some of them are single site endemics. They are only known from one place in the world or they might only be known from one place left in the world. But they just have a handful of populations. Um, and so those are the most rare. But really anything in this G1 through G3 rank, right, these are the things that, that have some sort of imperiled status and things that we need to be keeping an eye on. And so we've been starting to focus more and more on those. 
and getting more of those into our seed bank, um, including several things from the longleaf pine. And we'll skip that because I forgot to put pictures in there. Um, but why is this important, right? Uh, why is it important that we're doing the seed banking? Um, and it's because of this. Uh, each of these bars represents some different ranks that the state gives populations of, of plants. Um, and then uh, A is the best, right? These are our healthiest populations. Ds are our lowest. And then we get these uh, F, X, and Hs, right? These are things that haven't been seen for 20 years or more. And we're saying they're either failed to find or they've been extirpated or historical in North Carolina. And then we looked at how many of those populations we have in our seed bank. Um, and you can see those ones that are these failed to find, these ones that we think are missing from North Carolina, we have some of those populations in our seed bank. Um, and it becomes very important because these are four species, not all from longleaf pine, right, that have been extirpated from North Carolina. They don't occur in the state anymore. Uh, but because of our, our ability to have the seed bank, we've been able to start doing restoration work with all of these species. Um, the Canby's dropwort in the, the lower corner, uh, that is, uh, I guess that's your lower right corner, um, that is a species that does occur within the longleaf pine ecosystem. And it's pretty threatened throughout its range, but had one population left in North Carolina that hasn't been seen um, for about 20 years now. And we're actively doing a restoration project with our partners at the Plant Conservation Program on that. They have a property um, in Old Carolina Bay. They've had it logged. They're just waiting to get it burned. And as soon as they get it burned, we'll be able to take plants that we've grown here at the garden and get those back into the wild. Uh, we also do um, some work with Venus flytrap. Um, so we do have some conservation efforts that we've worked on over the years with Venus flytrap. Um, and this kind of stemmed my involvement uh, in this really heavily came um, in what about 2016 or 2017 and I was talking with one of our partners and friends and we're like, you know, this is the most well-known plant probably in the entire world, right? There's not very many places you can go if there's a garden or a garden center that you can't find a Venus flytrap but it's endemic only to a very small area of North and South Carolina. So it's the super special plant. Darwin wrote about it, everybody knows it. And if you do a literature search about it, you will find hundreds of scientific papers. And like 95%, maybe 98% of those are all about the trap because it's cool. It's a plant that moves, right? But there's so little ecological research that had really been done on this, right? There's just a small fraction of literature and we were sitting around and we're like, wow, nobody even knows what pollinates this thing. And so we started chatting and we chatted with some friends from NC State who are entomologists. And they're like, oh, we could study that. Um, and so we started going out and it, it creates this really interesting study because it's also a carnivorous plant, right? So you've got this carnivore's dilemma. Um, if you need insects to pollinate your flowers, you also need insects to eat. Um, and so the questions kind of becomes research, like are those the same things? And we went out. We collected pollinators, did observations, efficiency studies, um, and then also looked in the traps. And we really found that what's in the traps isn't what's going to visit the flowers, right? They're very different guilds of insects. And this kind of started me on this, this train and this journey um, tangential to Venus flytraps, uh, but it became something that we started working with more and more here at the garden. Uh, and so my, my former supervisor, a lot of you know him, Johnny Randall, started this project where he wanted to try to seed bank as many of the populations as possible, and then to also collect leaf tissue so we could do a range-wide genetic analysis. So we have seeds collected from about 65 different sites all across North and South Carolina, and we've got that genetic material that we're working on getting analysis done so that we can understand what's going on in these populations. Um, a lot of the sites for Venus flytrap have been lost before. Um, there's still a lot of Venus flytraps out there in the wild, but a lot of these smaller sites, right, they're dwindling and they're disappearing. And so understanding the, the genetics of those populations will help us be able to do reintroductions in the future in a very guided and specific way. Um, and so some other reintroductions, we haven't reintroduced Venus flytrap to the wild yet, but might someday. Uh, but one of the projects we worked with, one of our reintroduction projects, um, sorry for that ridiculously long title. Um, these are our federal partners 
at work in their prime, right? Uh, like coming up with these titles for projects that encompass everything you're trying to do. Uh, but this was a project we worked with, which was the Army Corps of Engineers um, down on Fort Liberty. Uh, it also involved state parks um, and Department of Defense, since it was on base on post there. And we were working with this reintroduction of these rare species uh, on base. Uh, and really, it kind of stemmed from this high need for doing this. Uh, the species that we chose um, were all declining on the base between surveys over a, about a 15-year period. Um, we noticed, or 20-year period, we noticed that they were starting to decline, right? There's less and less of these populations. They're disappearing. Um, and that became important because for a couple of these species, like the Pyxidanthra and the Amorpha, more than half of the known occurrences in the world are on Fort Liberty. Um, you can see for Pyxidanthra, it's almost all of the known occurrences, except for a handful of them, are on that military base. Um, for Georgia lead plant, it's over two-thirds of the known populations are on that base. And they're dwindling. And so we wanted to work with some restoration on that. And so we kind of came up with this plan where we, we wanted to both do this experimentally, which is what we do for all of our reintroductions. We want to learn something from them, because we don't want to just go put plants in the wild and think, like, hey, we're done, right? Because it's not that easy. Um, sometimes they don't work. Sometimes they work better than others, and we want to understand why. And then as we do this, as we're faced with this future where we have to do this more and more because of our actions and because of climate change, that we can do this in more efficient ways and have higher success rates. And so we, we planted different age plants out. We grew them up here at the garden. We planted little tiny seedlings that were just a couple months old with one-year-old plants. Um, we did this over multiple years, uh, and then we followed those, and then we wanted to not just say, these plants that we put in the ground are doing okay, but we wanted to say, are they doing the same as, or better than, or worse than, a naturally occurring population that's viewed to be healthy. And so we did these measurements and comparisons between um, natural populations and wild populations. Um, and just some, some quick, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the data slides, this isn't a, a data talk necessarily, but you can see those kind of reddish bars, right? Those are our reintroduced populations and they're broke down by how many of them survived by how big they were. Um, and you can see that as we got bigger plants, Better, the more we could get more big plants out in there, the more likely they were to be able to survive. And so now we know, right, if we're doing these reintroductions and continuing to work with this species, that's one of the things we really need to focus on, is making sure the plants we're putting out are getting larger and are in those larger size classes. Um, so, skipped one on effort of time. Same story, just different numbers and different data. Uh, and so something else that we do a lot of, right, is this idea that stems around um, species rarity, right? What's causing species to be rare? And by understanding that, can we make better conservation recommendations? Can we create better management goals, better management practices through understanding these rare species and then improve them in the meantime, right, as a result of this? Uh, and, and population ecology is the tool that I'm, I'm most interested in. Um, and so really what we're trying to do with this is, is to link these ideas of population drivers, right? How does something respond to fire, right? If we change the fire regime, if we change burning growing season or dormant season, what effects does that have on the population? If we add more light, if we take light away, right? What are these, these changes? And then other things that go along with this, right? How is reproduction affected? What's the life cycle of these plants? And if we understand these, can we have better conservation outcomes? And so um, if we think about rarity, right, a lot of this becomes down to patterns and processes. And patterns of rarity, right, is, is really what are these historical drivers for making something rare. And it can be uh, something that spans a really long, wide range, um, like Schwabia americana. It's found from... Uh, New Jersey, all the way down through different longleaf habitats um, into Florida and Georgia, right into this far end of the southeast. Um, but there's very few of them. There's not very many populations left. The populations are dwindling. So you've got one type of rarity. And then Venus flytrap is kind of another example, right? It doesn't have a very broad geographic berth, but it's got a very narrow range. 
But where it occurs, there's actually quite a few of them. Some of those populations for Venus flytrap are really large. And, but it's still a rare plant. It still has conservation concerns. And so we've got these different, different tools. And so trying to understand those and then putting them through um, with these processes, right? What evolutionary factors are influencing them? What ecological factors, right? Fire, pollinators, um, we talked about that. And then how are those starting to interact with these population processes, right? How does um, fire change the number of flowers or the amount of reproduction? How does it change the survivorship of these individual plants? Um, and so some of the work that, that's kind of stemmed from this, uh, this was uh, kind of a side project that came from our reintroduction and working with Amorpha georgiana. Um, one of the things that we were noticing in studying the natural populations is every time there was a fire on, on the base, that there would be like this carpet of amorphous seedlings. And we're like, okay, this has got to be a fire response. And we wanted to kind of be able to show that definitively and then try to understand that a little more. Um, and so we took seed collections that we had made as part of our reintroduction efforts, and we started to do experiments on the seeds. And we learned a couple of things. So in the top graph, um, it's a little small, but you generally see as you go across the x-axis, you're getting hotter temperatures exposures. So you're starting with control, right? No exposure to any heat. It's just put in their growing conditions to see what happens. And then exposure to different temperatures of hot water, right? 40, 60, 80, and 94 degrees Celsius. And as you get hotter and hotter, more and more seeds keep germinating, right? So it's this strong cue that in order to break dormancy of those seeds, they need to be exposed to fire. And then the different color bars are kind of the other interesting piece with this is after we broke dormancy, we put them either in winter-like conditions, so like if you had a dormant season burn in December or January, versus a growing season burn like in April or May, right? And what's the difference in how many of those seeds successfully germinated and survived? And you can see that when you have growing season conditions and exposure to heat, you get a lot more seedlings. And this becomes a very important piece of the management tool if you want to manage that population. Um, another species that we kind of worked with, this is something that uh, we don't, didn't just work with with uh, the project on Fort Liberty, but we've done a lot of other work with this species, um, including some work with our friends and partners at the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Um, and this is rough leaf loosestrife. Uh, you can see it now in the uh, carnivorous plant beds. Um, go check it out after the talk. Uh, it's really quite a great plant. It's very interesting to work with. Um, it has this really bizarre life cycle. And one of the things that we get the pleasure of being able to do when you work at a botanical garden is to really play with the plants and get to see them in very different light than you would just seeing them out in the wild because we don't want to go out in the wild and start digging up plants and being like, I don't know what's going on with these roots, right? But in a garden, we get a chance to do that quite regularly. And one of the things we found is that this plant has a really weird life history. Um, we kind of called it a pseudo-annual, pseudo which is, I feel like, kind of a made-up term. It's like a pseudo-term to keep <laughs> being repetitive, right? But what it's doing is really quite odd. Um, in the top uh, picture, top left picture, you can see this is a rhizome that was taken out of a pot during the growing season. It's got this long, thin, underground stem, just a tiny bit of roots on it, and then a couple of stems growing off of that that have leaves on it. In the bottom picture, this is that same rhizome that's dug up later in the winter. And you can see what was a very bright white rhizome in the top picture is now kind of brown, and it's actually getting kind of weird but there's these little bright white rhizomes, new rhizomes that are coming off of it. And so what's happening is that parent rhizome only lives one year, and then it dies, it decays. And these new rhizomes that are starting to grow off the side of it are what kind of carry on that lineage. So as these rhizomes creep around in the soil, right, the one parent from one year is dead, right? It's still the same, same genotype, it's still a clone, but it's finding these ways and it's creeping around in these landscapes um, and it's responding to different management conditions. Some of the long-term monitoring uh, that was started in the 90s, they put these plots out and they're like, we're gonna go out and count 
all the Lysimachia. And then they weren't getting burned and they were getting shrubby and all the Lysimachia was like following the edge of the shrub line and people were like, well, this is weird, especially because it doesn't flower and set seed very often. So how's it moving? And it's this life cycle, this weird life cycle that lets us be able to see that and better understand that. Um, okay, so kind of staying in the same vein, the picture missing, there it is, um, uh, of understanding population ecology. This is some of the work, a um, little preview of some of my, my graduate work, um, looking at this reproductive ecology for Sandhills milk fetch. Um, this is a plant that I, I really love. Um, again, uh, longleaf pine, it grows in these xeric longleaf pine woodlands, um, mostly through the sand hills of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Most of the populations that exist, most of the plants that exist left are on the Sand Hills Game Lands Wildlife Resource Commission and on Fort Liberty. Um, and it's kind of an oddball. Uh, it doesn't actually like to be burned. So it lives in this ecosystem that needs fire, right? That has to have fire to be maintained. A fairly high fire frequency, but the higher frequency some of these woodlands are burned with Astragalus mishoei, the models show that it actually starts to do worse and worse. And so one of the things that we're trying to understand that better with this species is what's, what's really driving that and how can we help understand what this species needs so that we can get the land managers to make better prescriptions with fire. But in addition to that, there aren't very many seedlings of this plant that ever show up. Um, it's a really poor reproducer. And uh, even Barnaby, um, he wrote this massive tome on astragalus of North America, only like 500 species of them. Um, if you don't know this genus, it's the most species rich genus in the world. 3,200 species and counting worldwide. Massive, massive genus. 500 in North and South America, over 450 in North America alone. And there's like 12 in the southeast, and this is one of them. Um, and it's terrible at what it's trying to do in some ways because it's not responding to fire like you think it would in a fire-maintained system. And it's really bad at reproducing. And so trying to understand what's happening with that. So the first thing we want to do is quantify, is it really that bad at reproducing? And the answer is, yeah, it's really that bad. Um, so these are fruit-to-flower ratios, right? Uh, so how many fruits are being formed based on the number of flowers? Um, less than 3% of the flowers in any given year are making a fruit. Um, and if you think about a plant that's making hundreds of flowers per flowering individual, and only 3% of those on average are turning into a fruit, they don't all have seeds or many seeds in them. So it's got this problem. And this is starting to explain why we're not seeing seedlings, why we're not seeing these new recruits to replace mortality. Um, and so we started to kind of dig around and say why. Uh, and one of the questions, of course, becomes, right, uh, well, is it being pollinated? Uh, and so we did a pollinator study, and we found that it's really these uh, medium and large bees, um, like the ones pictured. Uh, so bumblebees, megachylids, and osmias, right, these large medium bees that are visiting, they're able to manipulate the flower structure, expose pollen. Um, so they're getting visitation, but it's really low. Uh, there's not very, very many visits going on. Um, and so it kind of starts to bring this question of like, oh, well, is there uh, a pollen limitation? And so the two things that can drive reproduction are not enough pollen or the wrong kind of pollen um, or not enough resources for the female plants, right, the flowers to make fruits. Uh, and so we did a, a study where we both manipulated the pollen by doing hand pollinations and added fertilizers and added water uh, into all these different things. Um, and in this kind of messy graph, you'll see there isn't really a whole lot of variation. Um, there's not a lot going on. Adding pollen didn't really increase it, tiny bit, but not significantly so. And adding resources never really improved this. So it's not really either of those things. Um, and what we kind of are fearing might have happened with this is this these bottlenecks. The populations are in the dry uplands, and these are the most used areas, right? They're, they're often destroyed, lost, right? They're the areas that are impacted by military training, um, by people driving ATVs. Uh, and so the populations are all small. Um, if you find one with 100 individuals, it's a massive population. 
Uh, and so there might have been this genetic bottleneck um, where now these self-incompatible plants are not able to reproduce with each other. And so in a population, they're basically all blocking themselves from having successful reproduction. Okay, um, and our last piece here um, is to talk a little bit about our plant material center. Um, and so this is no longer talking about rare plants. This is moving into this world of these common plants, these widespread workhorse species that we need to have in order to do restoration work. Um, and there's a lot of great work that's going on in longleaf pine ground layer restoration. Um, there are tons of private landowners that are doing this. There are a lot of organizations that are doing this. But one of the biggest limitations is, is when you have hundreds of acres that you're trying to restore back into functioning longleaf is getting the right materials. Um, a lot of the species, like we said, are endemic to the southeast. So you can't order them from seed companies from Minnesota. Even if you could, you wouldn't want to do that because it's probably poorly adapted to living in the southeast. And so we are uh, working through some of our programs to try to remedy, um, remedy some of that and to help be a part of that and play a role of that. Um, so you have Brandon giving me the thumbs up right here at front row, uh, also in this picture. Um, so for years, the garden has been involved with these wild seed collections. Um, and about four years ago, uh, almost five years ago now, we got a donation from a private individual uh, to kind of start taking some of our seed collections to continue making those, but to start moving more of them into these uh, plant materials threads. So we go out and we make seed collections of wild plants. Um, you can see in the heat map here where we've been, where most of our collections are. And we have quite a few from the coastal plain and the sand hills areas. Um, and what we, we want to do with those, oh, let me back up one more time. Um, in addition to that, we've also just started working with the Forest Service. Um, and we're doing this across North Carolina, but one of the places that we're focusing on specifically is in the Croatan National Forest. And we're really targeting these workhorse species from wet and dry longleaf pine savannas. Um, and so we take these seed collections that we make in the wild uh, and we bring them back to the garden and we start doing work on them with propagation, right? How do we propagate them? How do we store the seeds? Can we do trials to show that these things are successful? And then developing ways and tools that we can farm them. Because ultimately, uh, when uh, the Nature Conservancy or Wildlife Resource Commission wants to do these restoration projects, they're talking about pounds of seeds, right? Tens and hundreds of pounds of seeds. And seeds are tiny, right? A pound of seeds is like millions and millions of seeds. And the only way to get those is by farming them, by having these large production scale um, aspects, right, where we can work with growers, where we can work with small farmers to start to grow these up. And part of that is trialing it. Um, we can't go to somebody who's living, right, a farmer or a seed company who's living completely depends on whether or not they have a product to sell and give them seed and be like, hey, grow this, and then have them be like, hey, that didn't work at all, and now five years of my life is gone, and I have made no money from it. So we want to start right trialing these plants, right, showing that it's possible, showing that we can do this, and then get them into the hands of people that can start doing this at larger and larger scales so that we have these workhorse species, these really important plants that are making it back out into the landscape for restoration projects. All right, um, and so as I kind of said before, right, this isn't possible without a lot of other people. Um, I started trying to put individual names on this and like the font was like down to like four point font, um, but that I couldn't read. So I was like, okay, taking the individual people off, right? But in addition to all of the partners and the people that we work with on these projects, right? <laughs> There are numerous people from every single one of them, right, that has really made this possible. And so just as a, a takeaway, right, the, the work that we do um, really relies on both funding from outside sources and on the partners and the relationships that we've built and able to, to be able to keep doing this work. So with that, I will we'll end and say thank you. I think I have left some time. I was trying to check time. Yes. Let's yeah, thank time. you, Mike. We certainly do. Questions in the room? Thank you. Um, 
seeds are tiny. And do you ever do, or has there been a move to do the equivalent of like citizen science, citizen master gardener, whatever, giving some of these special seeds, not the extremely rare ones, but to individuals to do in their home gardens to pass out through the native plant society plant sales and so forth. Um, as, as yet another avenue, small, but to get some of the things out where people are becoming more familiar with some of these plants. Um, our program doesn't do that specifically with any of the common species. Uh, the garden does that, of course, right? So we do have the seed distribution program through the garden. Um, you know, a lot of what, what we're working on with, with PMAS um, is trying to increase these at restoration scale. And so, right, the practitioners in this case are doing that. Um, with the rare plants, we don't really do that because it's, it's not really part of our rare plant policy, um, which kind of precludes that, like, let's distribute the rare plants for these purposes. And part of that becomes this genetic issue of, like, if we're giving somebody just five or ten seeds and they're growing them in their garden, they've got a very, very narrow slice of that genetic piece. Um, and particularly for the rare plants, for, for all plants, for all living things, that genetic diversity is important. So, um, yeah, we don't really, don't really do that. But the garden does do that and on a, a larger scale through that seed program that we have. We've got a question from an online participant. Is there any information about the mushroom population in the longleaf ecosystem? Uh, that is a great question. Um, I know very little about mushrooms except for the, the fact I like to saute them and eat them sometimes. So I, I cannot answer that. But um, yeah, I guess I don't know. If, I don't think we did have a mushroom, a longleaf mushroom program. So for the next iteration, that's a good note for Joanna and I to try to remember. <laughs> Um, you mentioned refugia at the beginning of the talk. Can you define that, please? Yeah, so refugia, when we're talking um, geologically and evolutionarily, right, it's, it's places where um, under different climates um, that there's still a place where these plants and animals have a place where they can live and survive. A refuge. A refuge. And it may look very different than what we know today. Uh, there's some, some theories about during the last glaciation, right? People are like, it was colder, right? And not hot and not necessarily the same vegetation structure. So these plants that were here in refugia that need open sunny habitats, there wasn't fire. So what was it? And people are like, well, there was these massive winds that were coming off the ice shelf. That's just a theory, right? That were keeping it open, right, less, less trees, and these were the pockets, right, where they lived, and then as the, the glaciers retreated, and you had these little pockets of open areas where these plants and animals lived, and the landscape changed, and fire became important, they found their ways into those pockets, into those new areas. Yeah. Great question, thank you. Thanks. Any other questions in the room? Debbie. Yeah, you mentioned the DNA work of the fly traps, you know, particularly the, the, you know, the plant material itself. Do you have any idea of a timeline for when that will be concluded and available? Yeah, so the question is about the timeline for the genetic study. Um, all the DNA extractions have been done, um, and I'm not the point person on this, so I'm guessing a little bit because I haven't talked to Johnny specifically about it. Uh, and we've got all of the data in the hands of somebody. I think they're just waiting to kind of do all the alignments and get all the information. Um, it's been an interesting thing to learn about. Uh, that genus, right, fly traps, it's a monotypic genus, and it's evolutionarily, like, really old. And so the genome for this, um, they're using next generation sequencing, and the genome for fly traps is huge. And it's created a lot of problems of making, being able to do those alignments and get all of the pieces put together to solve that puzzle. So um, it's in works. I will say hopefully soon, maybe by the end of the year, I would hope, knock on wood. But it'd be great to have that information finally. Any more questions in the room? We don't have any more coming in on Zoom. OK. 
Mike, thank you so much. Great presentation. And thank you. I learned a lot and grateful to have you here presenting with us today. Thank you all for being here. And thank you to our Zoom audience as well.